I want to take you into the world of animism. Animism is a way of seeing the world that's common to indigenous people. People from New Zealand, Māori, through to Inuit in the Arctic. It's an experience that's open to all of us here. It's hard to explain this experience in a language that does not have words to express it. But I'm going to try, so I hope you guys will stick with me. And there are three reasons why. Animism enables us to create more value and meaning in our lives. It turns the things around us from things we use to someone we relate to. And it brings us wealth. Last year, I came across an opinion piece in a national daily newspaper. The article described the way Ngai Tahu, that's the indigenous people to this area, see the mountains, rivers, and lakes as family members. This is one of the key attributes of animism. It's to see personas or people and personalities in the world around you. However, this article chose to ridicule Naitahu. What it said was this way of seeing the world was a product of ignorance. In fact, the author went on to say that Naitahu's sacred mountain, Aoraki, was nothing more than a big pile of rocks. And that um, Naitahu's thought that it was an ancestor was um, an act of superstition. Now, initially, I was given where I work, I was pretty angry by this article. But I quickly began to say, well, this author's actually given me a pretty big insight. The insight he gave me was a word he used, and that was the word belief. He said Naitahu believed Aoraki was an ancestor. Now, Naitahu didn't believe Aoraki was an ancestor. Naitahu experienced the mountain as an ancestor. And that's a big difference. There's a difference between experience and belief. Now, this is a banana. <laughs> Would you say that you believe in the taste of a banana? You wouldn't. You'd say you know the taste of a banana. The reason, maybe someone who had never tasted a banana before would say, I could have a belief about the taste of a banana, I could imagine the taste of a banana. But somebody who had actually tasted a banana, they know. So there's a difference between belief and knowing. Let's take it another step. Let's say that you have never, you've never ridden a bicycle before. And somebody gives you a book on how to ride bicycles. Now, could you read that book, and then could you get on a bicycle and ride? You couldn't, because you would just have a belief in your imagination. You wouldn't have the experience, because with experience comes knowing. So, let's t take this further. Who's got a dog like this in their family, or a pet? Or knows someone who does? To me, this is the place to start experiencing animism. Ask yourself this, is your pet a member of your family? Absolutely. <laughs> For most people, the answer is yes. Of course your dog's a member of your family. Now, these people don't believe them, their dog's a member of the family. They know it's a member of their family. They experience it. Now, the reason they experience it is because they can see their dog can show love and affection. They can relate to it. They can see its identity. Consequently, we can say that this dog here, you know, it's going to have a personality, and you're going to be able to relate to it. But we can say it, we know it's not a human, because even though it's part of our family, we know it's not a human. We know it's a different species. But we can say, because it has a personality, that it is a person, because it's part of our family and we can relate to it. But it's not a human person. It's what we'd call a dog person. Now, the next step with animism is to take that experience of personhood with the family pet and you just start s spreading it out to all living things. And one way to do this is look at your family tree. Now, imagine your family tree, cousins, uncles, blah, blah, blah. Go all the way back to your, your great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents. Now, 
This here is also your family tree, but it's probably not one you're so familiar with. This one tells us that we're all descendant from an entity some billions of years ago. So that when you walk out of this door, you can look around you and everything is your cousin, however distant. Every single living thing is a relation of yours. Every tree, everything. So, you know, and that explains why we can connect with our dogs. Because if you look at that, animals are just one, uh, one, one branch of this family tree. We're really closely related. That's why you can identify with your pet. You're actually, you know, you know each other pretty well. And that's why it's natural that indigenous people refer to, uh, to fish, for example, as fish cousins or dog people or, um, or, or tree brothers or, and so on. So you can see it makes perfect sense and it's natural from that perspective. And when you see it from this evidence here, now, the next step, though, is that indigenous people also extend that idea of personhood beyond, the fa beyond living things to include all the elements, the sky, the, a lake, a river. And the reason they do that, if any of you here are mountaineers and you spend a lot of time in a mount on the mountains, you get to know the mountain. The mountain has a personality. It's brooding one day, another day it's... It's somewhat different. It has characteristics. It has a personality. And this here is Al Raki. Yeah, he's the oldest brother of all, all the younger brother mountains. And he's got broad, tall shoulders. And he braces himself against the westerly wind. He is the essence of dignity. And that's why he's not a pile of rocks. And that's why respectful climbers do not stand on his head. <laughs> so when, like Naitahu, You've lived in a place for a thousand years. You come to know the personality, and if you're open to the experience of animism, you will come to know the personalities of everything around you, a river, a lake, a mountain, or a, or a tree. These things become your way of seeing and mapping your world. Now, that's only one part of animism. There's lots of parts, but I'm only going to cover a second part today. And that second part is, a, is an important one. How do you actually relate to these different persons of your world? And for Māori, the key word is, is modi, like mowing the lawns, modi. And um, this is what modi is, is best described using an example. Now, let's say um, we pollute a river. A simple example. We pollute a river. What happens to that river? it will produce uh, less fish or less abundance and vitality of life. So what we would say is that the modi of the river had declined because the river is not providing to us in the same way. It cannot provide, uh, it doesn't have as much vitality, it doesn't have as much life force, which is the definition of modi. Okay, let's take that another step. And then we say that river's a person. Now what, have you, what do you do to a person when you take away their ability to provide. You take away their dignity, you take away their mana. So what you say in Māori is that their mana has declined, their dignity has fallen. Now this leads to what we might call a vicious cycle. So if you reduce the mana of the river, it will give rise to scarcity. Because there's less fish, it will lead to your mana declining because you have less to give. And in turn, so it's a vicious cycle. But we can also turn that cycle around to a virtuous cycle. Let's say we have actions that increase mana of non-human people, rivers and so on. And then it gives rise to abundance and our mana is increased. And that is the essence of sustainability from that Māori perspective. So, now we can see what animism is. It's about seeing the personality of the trees and birds and animals and so on around us and the elements. However, it's, it's also about modi. It's about their vitality and the relationships we have with them. Now, back to my original idea. We need to be open to the experience of animism. It enables us to see what things, not what things are, but who things are. 
And that's a really important distinction. Not what things are, but who things are. What it means is we don't relate to things as resources, but we relate to them as people. And with that comes a whole lot of ethics. And the importance for Queenstown is, if you allow the elements and the wild things to speak that are found here, if you describe their personalities and stories, that can only be found here. That is Queenstown's point of difference. In fact, it's every place's point of difference. It's what makes this place unique. Now, this philosophy probably seems slightly esoteric. Um, so what I want to take you into is my work and how I enable the elements to speak. Now, you probably, most, some of you here know this, Ponamu. Now, Knight, well, Greenstone. Now, Naitahu owns one of the most iconic elements in New Zealand. That's Ponamu, Greenstone. In fact, you know, there's probably lots of you guys wearing it right now. And uh, the ownership of, of, of Ponamu was returned to New Zealand, I mean, for, to Naitahu, uh, a few years ago by the New Zealand government. And, and my job was, for Naitahu was to figure out how to build a business around Ponamu that captured that Naitahu experience. Over many years, the mana and the modi of, of Ponamu had declined. And this was because there were, most of what you get in the shops here is cheap Chinese uh, import, uh, mimicking what's here. Or it's, been, or it's from stone that's been stolen from the mountains towards the coast from here. And so um, I, what I wanted to do was uh, find a way in which to restore Ponamu's taonga status or sacred status. And I, what I wanted to do was find a way where we could connect someone who we, wore it or bought it back to an authentic piece that they knew where it came from. And so consequently, my team put, put together a tracing system um, for Naitahu, and this is it here. And what it enabled is a wearer, when they buy a piece, um, we actually looked at the, ice, the, uh, the local barcode icebreaker thing, and what it enables someone to do is to identify the origin stone, where the stone came from, the piece that's been carved and the carver that carved it, but more importantly, it takes them back to the elements. It takes them back to the mountains and to the rivers and to the places from which it originates. What it does is it enables the elements to speak and enables a person to create a connection and a relationship with them. But more recently... I've been working on another venture here in Queenstown, and that's the revival of the old Naitahu perfume, Taramia. Now, Taramia is made out of the prickly Spaniard, which is this one. Don't, you don't want to get caught in the mountains around this stuff. And uh, I think the farmers call it bastard grass. Um, and uh, it, it used to be gathered here and extracted, and then it was turned into a perfume. And in the old days, it used to be traded, and it was more valuable than Ponamu, and it used to be traded north. And it was basically the perfume of the aristocracy. And many of the Naitahu love stories and proverbs and sayings have, have, uh, have taramia woven within them. Uh, it also has uh, potent aphrodisiac qualities. If, uh, I think Michael Sly has some samples out of the back later, if anyone's interested. Um, however, in, in particular, it speaks to the relationships between people, mountains, and the taramia itself. Uh, by fortune, we were approached by the friend, friendly Queenstown um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, Michael Sly, and he compelled us to begin exploring the commercial potential of the perfume. Um, he'd been exploring it himself. He'd been playing with it in his garage, um, kind of like, if you can imagine the set of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you know, that experimenter, that's kind of like Michael's garage. And he'd been like, brewing it up and stuff, and he'd looked up the old anthropological texts and he worked out, you know, how to, how to, um, how to, how to, trying to, trying to recreate it. And anyway, we go, oh, why don't we set up a partnership? So what we did was, with Michael, we built up a presentation and uh, we wrapped all the stories around it and uh, it told, you know, it allowed everything to speak. And with this audacity, we took that up to the World Perfume Congress in New York. Um, and we had this sort of frenzied, hungry response from the international perfume houses. 
um, we quickly realized we had something very, very special. Uh, through the science, we've found it's got special compounds that have never been found before. But also, if it's like a piece of music, Taramiyo has all the rights and notes for a perfumist. That's like, you know, we it's sort of the jackpot. Um, but what really brought it, um, what really made it present, was that it spoke to Tahuna, or Queenstown. It spoke to the elements here. It spoke to the relationships between people and the love stories and the history. And that is what made it. It was all of those elements. So now we're doing the R&D behind Taramia to make it available to, those, to everyone in New Zealand. So, what, the essence of what I've been trying to say is that anima, when we animate things, the trees and, and uh, lakes and so on around us, it takes us to a special place, a place of meaning. Through animism, anybody can be indigenous. That's because we are seeing the world as we are part of it, as we are in a family relationship with everything. And we can all reconnect to that value that has been lost. That's always been in our culture, and it's still unconsciously within Western culture, and it, we still see it played out in movies like um, Lord of the Rings. And it's something that's under your feet, and it's all around you. And um, what it also leads to is a sense of complete at-homeness, because you know that you're surrounded by relatives. Everybody's connected to you. They might not always have your best interests in heart, but they're, uh, you're still connected. So um, I hope now you've, 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 you've developed a, a real understanding of where I'm coming from and of animism. And now I hope that that uh, experience, when you walk out the door and you view the world around you, that that experience will be open to you all. <laughs>